Good afternoon. I uh, want to welcome all of you uh, to CSIS. Uh, very glad that you could come out today to have a discussion uh, about uh, Dr. Sheila Smith's uh, recent book. And we feel very privileged uh, to be having this event for really what is such an important uh, uh, topic. Uh, I'm Bonnie Glazer, and I'm a senior advisor for Asia at uh, CSIS and the Freeman Chair uh, for, for China Studies. And uh, Sheila and I have collaborated in many ways uh, on issues pertaining to China and Japan. And uh, I was so looking forward uh, to, uh, to reading her book, and now I have. And uh, so I have lots of questions, and I know that many of you uh, do as well. Um, after our event, uh, we will have a reception, and we will also be selling some books outside. And I have to tell you, this is such a hot commodity that the remaining editions of intimate rivals are sitting out there on the table. <laughs> That's all there are. <laughs> so unless yeah. they try to do <laughs> a, a second printing, which I hope they will. Yes, they will. Um, but probably not tomorrow, not but tomorrow. anyway, soon. No. Uh, no. But if you do uh, want the book, then of course you should all buy it uh, today. Uh, so uh, just very briefly, uh, introduce uh, Sheila Smith, uh, who, as you know, an expert on Japanese politics and foreign policy. She's a senior fellow for Japan Studies at the Council uh, for Foreign Relations. Um, and in addition to this wonderful uh, book, uh, uh, she's recently published a study entitled Japan's New Politics and the U.S.-Japan uh, Alliance uh, at the Council. So. Um, um, I think we'll uh, start maybe our discussion uh, just talking about why you decided uh, to pick this topic to write about. Thank you. Well, first, Bonnie, let me thank you for inviting me. I, um, as Bonnie says, we have collaborated over the years since I've come to Washington. In particular, that collaboration has been one of the great delights about be for being here in DC and being part of the think tank world as we have colleagues in, in other institutions like Bonnie who intellectually tried to grapple uh, with the same kinds of problems. And I've learned a lot from Bonnie over the years. So thank you for having me. Um, so Intimate Rivals, I get a lot of questions about the book. Uh, today, nobody really asks me, why would you want to write a book on this topic? Because it is the topic of the moment. And to be honest with you, in the final stages of the manuscript, I kept having to rewrite and update and rewrite and update. So it is very, um, very much on the minds of not only Japanese and Chinese policymakers, it's clearly on the minds of American policymakers as well. But when I started the book, I was really, um, for those of you who know me, I've done most of my research in the past. I started my PhD dissertation writing about the US-Japan relationship mm -hmm. and Japanese security planning and the domestic politics of Japanese strategic choices. And so I, having spent a lot of time thinking about that, it was becoming increasingly clear to me in the early 2000s that there, was, there were bubbles and currents in the Japan-China relationship that deserved a little bit more attention. But also, for those of you who know Japan, the other side of Japan's alliance with us has always been a very large and very important relationship with its neighbor, with Beijing. So I didn't start out this book in the, in the midst of tensions between Tokyo and Beijing, although you could sense changes. Some important changes were going on. Prime Minister Koizumi was prime minister at the time. Of course, the Yasukuni Shrine issue became a bigger and bigger component of that bilateral mm -hmm. relationship. But so too were trade disputes. So too were other kinds of, of rippling across, if you'll forgive the pun, ripplings across the <laughs> East China Sea. And this was long before the island dispute really came to the fore of the bilateral relationship. So my Japanese colleagues all say to me, why Mr. Koizumi on the cover? Why not Mr. Abe? <laughs> and you'll sell more books if you have Mr. Abe on the cover. <laughs> and I should have thought about that a little harder. But, but, but the story really does begin in the early 2000s. It really does look at a longer stretch of time, mm. like a decade and a half or so of the Japan-China relationship. And I highlight a little bit on the contentious problems, the problems not just the island dispute, but things like frozen gyoza <laughs> and food, sa food safety. right? the maritime boundary, and of course, the Yasukuni Shrine issue. So um, in the book, you talk about how Japan's policy towards China is sometimes seen as a confrontational policy, uh, but then in fact it was one of accommodation, and that that policy of accommodation essentially didn't work and then started to change. 
Now, later in the book, you write that Japan's policy toward China is better understood as one of adaptation. So can you talk more about that? Sure. I, I think we, you know, we, we're, we're very myopically focused on this rising China, right? We are yeah. maybe not myopically. It's a big subject, and we pay a lot of attention to it. But we treat the shorthand of a rising China as if we know it. Um, Japan's relationship with post-war relationship with China began in the 1970s when normalization talks began. The peace treaty was 1978. It wasn't that long ago, right? Um, and it was halfway through the Cold War. Um, and I think the Japanese government's perspective in that negotiation was, of course, to defend Japanese interests, to articulate Japan's interests and advocate for Japan's interests in the relationship. But it wanted to accommodate uh, this new and, and very anticipatory relationship it was going to have with the People's Republic of China. It didn't mean that Japan accommodated all of Chinese interests, but it did mean mm. that Japan, I think, and I use this phrase in the book, began the interaction with China in a spirit of reconciliation, but mm -hmm. it saw reconciliation as being accomplished through economic interdependence. So economic interdependence in some ways was a strategy. It was not just the outcome of the relationship, mm -hmm. but it was a strategy for reconciliation with this neighbor that it had been at war with in World War II. So that's where I start the story. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to understand the approach to the post-war Japanese relationship with China to then understand the evolution of it now. So the rising China piece of the story is where I get to the adjustment or the adaptation part at the end of the book. Um, and, I, and again, I wanted to sort of look over time at the way in which Japan had to adjust to a changing China. And I spent a lot of time, especially as I was drafting, you know, as you write books, you write and you edit and you rewrite and you get responses and feedback. And I got a lot of feedback with, don't, you know, rising China, it's a trajectory. We don't know where China's going. And I, so I had to sort of step back and change my language a little bit to mm. a changing China, a transforming China. I wanted to chronicle the process by which Japan had to adapt. And so that's why that adaptation and adjustment is the phrasing I use at the end. You do not find in Japan uh, a wholesale consensus on how to move forward with China. You certainly don't find a consensus about confronting China mm -hmm. in Japan. So it's not as if, you know, we talk in inside the beltway a little bit in shorthand. You accommodate, you confront, right? But this is a little bit trying to get underneath that language to talk a little bit about the evolution of policy and what the learning has been over time. And I think it's a little bit more gentle than that. That's not to say it shouldn't be worrisome at times, but it's not necessarily that there's a consensus in Japan about confronting this China, even on the island issue. Now, if we look at uh, public opinion polls, uh, clearly there's been a radical shift, a negative direction of Japanese uh, opinion, the public opinion towards uh, China. And you also describe, of course, the shift that has taken place in terms of Japanese policy towards China under this pressure from uh, the people over these sets of issues that, uh, that you talk about. So I wonder whether this is these opinions and the policies um, that have followed, whether they are irreversible. Is this now a trend where uh, we are going to really see continued very tough times in Sino-Japanese relations? Is it the uh, shift in the balance of power that is fundamentally, I think, uh, in China's favor uh, that will drive this? Uh, or is it possible that if we see a, an adjustment in China's policy, and I'm a little hesitant to say that we have already begun to see this because it's, <laughs> it's very fragile and tentative, even though uh, Prime Minister Abe did meet with Xi Jinping mm -hmm. uh, in Indonesia uh, today. Uh, but if there is a change in China's policy, if they have recognized they need to have a better relationship with Japan, how much of the attitudes and the policies that have taken place are really irreversible? So the good news is there's now two handshakes we can look at, right? Right, right. <laughs> and the Bandung I, I, I didn't see what the faces looked like. Is, well, is there a photograph? I yeah, only saw I, the I, text. I, I tweeted it this morning. Okay. And so there was, a, there was a Nikkei photograph that I tweeted this morning where Mr. Xi sort of looks like he's smiling. But the photograph is sort of taken off over his shoulder. So Mr. Abe is definitely smiling. And oh, she, she looks a little bit more like okay. he might be actually having good. a little grin. But at least he's not going like this, which right. is what we got at APAC, right? right? So the visuals, the optics matter clearly. And this one looked, even regardless of substance, this one looked a little bit more comfortable mm. for both of them, mm. frankly. Um, but 
you, you situated the argument really well, Bonnie, and that is that you know, clearly Japanese policymakers, right, in the 1990s had understood that they were, they were running up against a slightly different set of Chinese interests, right? So whether it's security or economic interests, right, there was clearly a shifting appreciation in the Japanese government, um, economic, strategic uh, assessment that, yeah, this is gonna be a more difficult, challenging relationship for the policymaking community in Japan. But the public didn't come along to that conclusion, I think, until the decade later. And mm. the cases that I look at in the book, there are four cases. They're all contentious uh, cases. And I start out with what I call the, the Japanese imperial of veterans. So I talk about the veteran issue in Japanese domestic politics and how China was responding and why and how that evolved, the domestic politics of that evolved from one that was really constituency driven, in my view. So you have bereaved veterans association, very important to the conservative political party in Japan, right? You've got veterans constituencies in every democracy are powerful constituencies, right? Japan is no different in that respect, right? Where they were different, obviously, was in how to honor those, those, those veterans. Uh, and that was a divisive issue inside Japan itself. Once China began to get into the criticism, mm -hmm. right, of the conservative leadership, and it began with Prime Minister Nakasone, Right? It came back again with Prime Minister Koizumi, and you see it again with Prime Minister Abe. The Chinese criticism of that then began to create a slightly different public mood around that, that issue. Largely, this is not an issue for foreigners to, to, to criticize us about. So people who had strong beliefs about Yasukuni got stronger beliefs. Some people who didn't have any beliefs, and they were mostly younger Japanese, began to adopt beliefs. But they were beliefs really based on the criticism not on the original constitu constituency-driven interest in, in, in their grandparents or whatever. So I think that's an important piece of the puzzle, is how Chinese criticism, how Chinese behavior then factors in to what are already domestically pretty powerful issues. So that's one case study. The others are the maritime boundary dispute, much less domestic interest group activism on that. You have some very particular interests, and I talk about them in that chapter. But the interesting thing about the maritime boundary dispute is it really doesn't have to do with intention or mishap on the part of the policymakers on either side, it's really about the dynamics that were set up by UNCLOS. You know, once both countries ratified the UN Law of the Sea in the 1990s, they had prepared for it. I think China perhaps prepared more diligently for that than maybe <laughs> Japan did. I think Japan's response in some ways was slightly delayed. Didn't really, fun didn't really appreciate all of the aspects that this would, would bring up in their relationship with China. But the, the, the competition then over where to place the boundary, how to define your difference of opinion with Beijing, also began to drive in some way the Japanese-Chinese reaction to the maritime boundary dispute. To get back to your question, though, the policymaking community versus the public, the public trajectory, and Genron MPO and the China Daily have done a very good job of polling over time yeah. in both countries, right? So if you're looking for data on public opinion polling, Genron MPO, MPO is a great place to look. And you look at the questions, not just how do you think about each other's country, but they ask, they, they get into the specific incidents. They get a little, little lower down into why do you think this way. But that data, data is a, it's a, it's a, what's the right mathematical term? How's your math, Lenny? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, a steep <laughs> angle. It goes up, it doesn't go like this. It goes just straight up across mm, the decade. Yeah. So yes. you've got the policymaking community kind of understanding the more complex dynamics, the mm, policy side. Mm -hmm. You've got the public, growing antipathy uh, in Japan towards China. And largely, some of these cases of contention are why. These issues happen. They don't get resolved. The Japanese public was continuously asking for resolution and evidence of resolution. And this gets to the, the final point of your question, which is, are we stuck here? I mean, China's rising. Japan is not. Um, are we stuck with this dynamic? And I don't think so. Mm. I think there's a lot of potential here for shifting the way the Japanese public see their relationship with China. Policymaking community may take a little bit more persuasion, <laughs> more dedicated persuasion, and I think that's what Mr. Xi and Mr. Abe have begun to work on. But I think the Japanese public is not only looking at Beijing's intentions, they're really looking at their own government's capacity to manage some of these more complex challenges. So if you get a, tr a little bit of traction at the diplomatic level, if you get a little, a little bit more evidence that China's long-term game is not antithetical to Japanese interests, if you get some demonstrated over time a sense of we can work these problems through together, 
in a mutually beneficial kind of way, the win-win formula. If it gets actually demonstrated to the Japanese public, then I think you don't have a foregone conclusion. And I think the responsibility is clearly on both sides. It's not just China's behavior, but also Japan has to work at finding that middle ground. It's going to be a lot of hard work. It's, it's just like the US policy challenge with a rising China. It will be a lot of hard work. But we've got to make the effort to demonstrate that we can navigate this complicated moment together. Xi Jinping was, in fact, quoted today as making, um, I would say, uh, a relatively positive comment mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, fact that both sides are working to try to improve the relationship. Uh, a more positive comment than I think he was quoted when he was met with uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, uh, at, at Apex. So now I wonder if what Xi Jinping is trying to do is to try and uh, give Prime Minister Abe a little bit more incentive uh, to deal with the upcoming anniversary mm -hmm. of uh, the uh, 70th anniversary of the end of World War II right. in a way that will help him right to further stabilize and uh, build this relationship uh, going forward. Now, obviously, China is not the only country who has some concerns about how Japan is going to deal with this anniversary. Uh, Korea is, uh, has its own set of uh, issues as well, and there's overlap with China. But I think the Chinese are uh, really yeah. watching this very, very closely. Uh, there are, uh, they want to know whether the prime minister is going to reiterate his apology, and if he's not going to reiterate, what new language is he going to say? So yeah. how do you think that the prime minister is going to approach this issue as it pertains to the, uh, the, uh, the anniversary itself, but also its implications for relations with China? I think you're right. I think I heard, uh, I saw that language at, mm. at the meeting, what got publicized on both sides. I, I saw clearly that, that there, there was a heads up for the rest of the year, yeah. which as you know is the 70th anniversary, and Xi Jinping himself is going to have an anniversary yes. on, in early September um, of the end of World War II, and for the Chinese, of course, this is the, the day of Japan's defeat, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it is incredibly important, I am not a diplomat, but when you listen to the diplomats speak, it's incredibly important to look at one meeting versus the other, and I thought the body language was different, but the spoken language was clearly different. When they sat down to talk, and this was on NHK this morning, um, Xi Jinping said, I understand that it's, it's incredibly significant that we met last year, so he was acknowledging last November's meeting, uh, and he also said, and this was an, a great occasion at, ban at Bandung, for me to meet again with Mr. Abe to hear his views, right? So I, that, that's exactly how I interpret it, so I'm glad that you're confirming that that was the right interpretation. Mr. Abe, on the other hand, was much more effusive, I thought, in, in a sense that this is the important relationship for mm -hmm. Japan. He, he, talked about the strategic, he didn't use the word strategic, but he used the language of the 2008 Hufukuda Summit, mutually beneficial strategic relationship. He used all the right language to say, we are in it for the long haul, and I thought that was the signaling that he was intending to give there as well. Um, so the 70th anniversary is going to be a very tricky time, I think, for Mr. Abe. He himself has already announced that he wants to have his statement. The Japanese uh, leadership every 10 years seem to make, want to make a statement about history. Um, the definitive statement in terms of public policy, of course, is Mr. Murayama's statement of 1995. That continues to be the statement that Mr. Abe endorses as national policy. Uh, but Mr. Koizumi made a statement after that, in the decade after for the 60th, and now I think Mr. Abe also wants to make his own statement. I think most of us in this room know individuals who are on a committee advising him about that statement, and many of those people understand and work abroad, work in China, um, have extensive foreign policy expertise. So I think he will get good guidance from that committee on not only the internal need for that, what that statement needs to say, but also for the external impact. I think Kitaoka Sensei has already said in public that Mr. Abe ought to say, uh, note Japan's remorse for the past. So I think we're not, we're not in the dark at all about the kind of advice mm -hmm. he's getting. I suspect he will also be very judicious uh, in the way that he approaches the subject of history in the, in the 70th anniversary when he speaks to the joint session of the United States Congress. Um, I, there, there will be a global audience for that speech, not just an Absolutely. American audience. And, uh, but I think it's important that the prime minister speak to Congress, first and foremost, because they invited him to speak there. 
There are a number of issues on our agenda that Congress cares deeply about. One is U.S.-Japan defense cooperation. The other, of course, is TPP and the future of our trade relationship. So they will also want to hear about the agenda, what U.S. and Japan are doing together. But they will be alert to the fact that the podium that Mr. Abe stands at is the podium that President Roosevelt stood at uh, many years ago, yes. right? And I suspect that Prime Minister Abe will as well. I don't think, my personal view, and this goes beyond the book, I don't think that we should make this visit by the Prime Minister of Japan next week an occasion to participate in the competition over interpretation of war memory. I don't think that's constructive. We have, as a fundamental basis of our relationship, reconciliation, historical, we, we have a history. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be afraid to talk about that history, but also we should celebrate the 70 years of effort that it took to transform this relationship. And I think we should be sustaining in our support of the effort to transform the relationships in the region as well. Great. Another question that goes a little bit beyond uh, the book, uh, or at least extends from some of the things you talked about in the book. Uh, you note that the, uh, the incidents around surrounding the Senkakus in 2010 and 2012 became tests of the US-Japan alliance. So how did the Japanese view the US handling of China in these incidents? Mm -hmm. And how did they view the US handling of China's rise overall? Do they see the alliance as up to the task? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> I will go to Japan and do a poll and get back an answer. <laughs> so when I write in the book, I do write about 2010, and I write again about 2012. And so I think in tw what, what amazed me about 2010 um, is that very quickly you had, uh, when Mr. Maihara became foreign minister, right? Mm -hmm. you had consultations with the United States. Um, for those of you who don't remember 2010, it was in September, it was a couple of weeks, it was very intense and very quickly escalated outside the normal bilateral channels of, of Japan-China. And I think that's the defining characteristic of what these crises have done for the Japan-China relationship is it's almost as if they can't solve it together and so both parties had to go outside. And for Japan, they, that meant coming to the United States as ally, right? Um, you know that we have a, our State Department has a position uh, that we don't take a, a position on the sovereignty of the islands. Uh, we do, however, have a position on the extension of Article 5 protections for territories administered by Japan. So basically that needed to be reiterated. Secretary Clinton reiterated it very straightforwardly. Uh, when the Japanese press asked our Joint Chief of Staff at the time, you know, what, what, what would happen if, and, and he very quickly said, without hesitation, the United States will stand by, its, will fulfill its treaty obligations. So there needed to be a restatement to, to reassure in Japan. Um, the 2012 one went a little further, though, because as you know, the Chinese insert then began to send, this wasn't a question of activists or fishermen, all of a sudden it was Chinese government vessels that began to uh, traverse the, the maritime boundary in and around the territorial waters in and around the, the Senkaku Islands. Um, and then that called for a rather different U.S. response. And we responded quietly without any statements by reorganizing our military forces to make sure there was no miscalculation mm -hmm. of our intentions should something happen. Um, but I think it also at that point became uh, the step at which not only did we reassure Japan uh, of our protections, uh, we began to talk to the Japanese about their ability to manage an escalatory dynamic, uh, which we saw from September into January, February 2013. Um, we began to talk seriously about this new aspect of alliance cooperation uh, in our militaries and our civilians at the highest level of government. Um, but we also began to feel very clearly the mantle of our need to communicate to Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, that this had begun now not to be a political series of tensions. This had now become a serious concern to the United States in terms of the potential for actual conflict. Um, so I think the role of the alliance has been multifaceted across time. It's not the, it's not the, it wasn't the same in 2010 as it became in 2012 when you got from Coast Guard insertion into the island near the Senkakus to that escalatory process that in the end um, had a, a, a Chinese ship uh, lock its radar, firing radar onto a Japanese ship. And so that, that role of the alliance, that role of our government and alongside Tokyo in trying to deal with risk reduction uh, to try and talk more forcefully with the Chinese about the costs of really miscalculating uh, U.S. intent or the alliance's preparedness to respond, I think that became much more serious. So we've evolved. I think we've learned 
I remember, uh, and you probably remember too, in the fall of 2012, there were many, many, many gatherings of, oh my God, <laughs> what's happening kind of gatherings. Like, what do, we meet? what do we know? How do we respond? How do we respond well? And our China expert community was engaged, right? Our Japan expert community was engaged. Our governments were talking to each other very, clear, uh, very closely. So it was an important moment for the alliance to adjust, to use my initial language, to adjust to this new reality. And I think we've come through it actually rather well. I think you'll see when Mr. Abe comes uh, to Washington next week. We also have a two plus two meeting between our defense and, and State Department uh, leaders. Um, and there'll be the announcement of the guidelines. And that guidelines will reflect, not completely that contingency, but it will reflect the learning that has gone on in the last several years over this tension. But just to push you a little bit more mm -hmm. on this, you know, here we are two and a half years after the September 2012. I think that uh, Japan is uh, very confident about uh, the U.S. commitment because we have said at the highest right. levels right. of our government, right, right. President Obama stating quite publicly right. that the security treaty covers these islands. But yet there seems to be a desire for uh, a, the U.S. position on sovereignty to shift. So I continue to hear yeah. from visiting Japanese, you know, is it possible? What can, if anything, can we do right. to get the United States to change its position that it's neutral mm -hmm. on sovereignty? So does that represent this sense that, once again, the US is, is really not signing up to, uh, to Japan's yeah. claim, and it should be? And then does that have negative consequences for the alliance, or is that not the case? So I hear the same conversation, <laughs> so we all are, um, Fielding those questions. I, I think it goes before those crises even happened, and I do write about this in the book. Mm -hmm. um, there is a perspective, especially among the diplomatic community in Japan, that the United States changed its position. Right. And it changed its position in the 1970s uh, when, we, when we were um, beginning to think about normalizing our relationship with the PRC. Now, the, 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 the secret behind the scenes documents between you know, Mr. Kissinger and, and others, um, they're not open yet. Right? We, we know people who were at the table, and, um, but I don't think we actually know. I think there's a little worry that at the table between Beijing and the United States, these islands factored prominently. They may have, they may not. To tell you the truth, the opening to China was such a huge geostrategic conversation that even if they were on the table, I suspect they were not the primary focal point of conversation in what was a really significant strategic uh, opening with, with, with Beijing. Um, all that being said, we all know here in this room that the history comes from at the point at which the Okinawa reversion was being negotiated. The islands were, Okinawa mm -hmm. Islands, the Bonin and Ryukyu Islands were given back to Japan. Um, up until that point, we had talked, the United States government had talked in terms of residual sovereignty. So we had used the word sovereignty. And so the, 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 the kind of diplomatic conversation then comes back down to, but, but those islands were part of Okinawa and you recognized our sovereignty before, so why did you adopt this new position of neutrality? Um, I'm not a State, State Department lawyer, and I will not try to <laughs> defend the, the, our position, but I do think that, understand that perception that we actually changed our position, first of all, and second of all, that it, it, it actually makes many in Japan quite uneasy, right? And so I think that's, we should recognize it. Um, I, so it's been there all the way through, to, to not to put too fine a point on it, but it has been really in the diplomatic circles because that's where we talked about these things. We didn't talk about them in the public way the way we do now because the, the island dispute has so emerged, right, as the focal point, um, not only of the Japan-China, but the alliance as well. I, I don't know that today, uh, if the United States stood up and said, we change our mind, you know, we, we found a document <laughs> deep in the archives and absolutely those islands belong to Japan. I, I'm not sure that, some people in Tokyo would be quite happy, um, but I'm not sure that would change the underlying fact is that the PRC belong, thinks that those islands belong to them. Uh, Japan thinks they belong to them, and let's not forget that, the, that Taiwan also has a claim uh, on those islands, also yes. it, it is subordinated under the Chinese claim. But the, the country that first became worried about our reversion of Okinawa, of course, was the Republic of China at the time. It was really that's when the United States uh, and the Republic of China had a, a deep conversation about those islands, and they disagreed with the Okinawan Reversion Agreement. History aside, 
Would it fix the problem? I don't think it would. Mm -hmm. The underlying problem is, uh, the underlying issue is that Beijing and Tokyo need to think about how to come to some accommodation or agreement or understanding or agreement to disagree. I don't mind whatever the diplomatic framework mm -hmm. is. But they manage this problem very nicely, frankly, with the yes. exception of a few activists, Japanese, Taiwanese, Hong Kong-based activists, and then in the 2000s, Chinese activists, right, PRC activists. They managed it quite effectively, mm -hmm. which gets us right back to the, can this relationship get better? I thought it was very ad adroitly done before that Abe Xi meeting in November. The four-point statement that some people read in Chinese and some people read in English, and <laughs> I read in Japanese and English. I can't read Chinese, but um, but one of those points, the, the way they reached agreement was not to talk about sovereignty at all, was to simply say, although we differ over the causes of tensions in the East China Sea, we agree that they are they carry risk, and we agree to work on reducing that risk. For me, that was, that was the breakthrough that we needed because then we needed the two leaders to meet and we needed them to address risk reduction in the East China Sea. Sovereignty only ends up with them not talking to each other. So let's talk about the other problems in the East China Sea. Let's talk about other kinds of frameworks joint energy development, mm -hmm. perhaps, which is what who, Mr. Hu and Mr. Fukuda agreed on in 2008. Let's go back to the places where Japan and China can agree to disagree, but can still cooperate. And you know, they negotiated fisheries treaties around those islands for decades, right? Because they decided that they would not fight over those islands. And so political leaders have a choice. Mm -hmm. Now, the one piece of the puzzle that I do talk about in the book is the domestic politics side. And they will have to advocate at home much harder, I think, than they did in the 1980s and 1990s. That that doesn't matter, right? That they should put the dispute aside in the interest of the bigger relationship. It will be a harder sell in Japan today than it was then. But it wasn't necessarily a completely easy sell, even mm -hmm. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Will there be specific constituencies in Japan yeah. that will be willing to uh, be the supporters vocally for a stronger uh, relationship with China? Well, the traditional supporters in Japan, as you know, have been the business community, right? There's $345 billion of annual trade between Japan and China. Mm -hmm. It is a huge um, asset to both countries' economies, right? So. But the business leaders in, China, in Japan have had a few setbacks in terms of they have been targeted when they got in the middle of, for example, the political debate over Yasukuni Shrine visits. Uh, we know a number of them. Uh, Kobayashi Yotaro right, um, got Molotov cocktails <laughs> uh, outside his house. Uh, so there is, a, there is a marginal group in Japan that does not uh, want to see the Japan-China relationship improved. They have at times either implicitly or explicitly uh, threatened violence. Um, and so I think we ought to be aware of the fact that just like in China, you have uh, violence against Japanese companies and individuals, Toyota's <laughs> products, right? Uh, we shouldn't underestimate the power of those who really don't want to see an improvement of the Japan-China relationship. They are a marginal part of the Japanese political world, though. Um, but I think mainstream politicians, especially on the conservative side today, would find it very hard pressed to say, okay, we can compromise on these islands in the interests of the Japan-China relationship. In fact, I would think you would be very hard pressed to find any Japanese politician, current politician, mm -hmm. right, who would be willing to advocate that position. Because popular sensitivities in Japan have changed. So you have to work on the public side mm -hmm. of demonstrating the benefit of this relationship again, anew. Um, before you can really get to a, a much different political understanding of the East China Sea and the islands themselves. Well, one last question, and then we will open it up uh, uh, to the audience for, for their questions. In the conclusion of the book, uh, you talk about uh, American interests, and you say that uh, competition between China and uh, Japan uh, for influence in Asia is harmful to US interests. Um, I agree with that, but maybe you can sort of elaborate as to why you think that's the case. Because I think that there has, you know, there's long been uh, some sentiment uh, in, in Asia, and particularly in China, that the United States just really doesn't want China and Japan 
to have a close relationship, that that wouldn't be in American interest. And so somehow the United States okay. favors <laughs> yeah. this competition, and indeed that we are even trying to cause it. And uh, so maybe you can talk about yes. that. <laughs> I've spoken to some of those Chinese <laughs> <laughs> of, the, of that opinion, but I, I you know, I, I spent, I have spent some time with you alongside you in many instances uh, in the track two, track 1.5 conversations with our Chinese colleagues, foreign policy experts, and others in China who think about China's Asia policy and. And more often than not, you got this, why are you intruding? Uh, why are you shaking this up? And why are you causing problems where problems don't exist? Um, I think it kind of lies along the same lines. Oops, sorry, Careful. that's my mic. I don't want to undo my mic, but my necklace is strangling me, so forgive me. Um, <laughs> I don't have a strangled guest. Um, I do think this goes along the line of the Cold War legacies kind of mm -hmm. the, uh, interpretation of US allies. Um, you know, I'm not sure everybody's completely wedded to this point of view when they ask us those questions. I think there's a little teaser, right, you know, kind yes. of poking a little bit at us. Um, but I do think there's two pieces of the puzzle. There is, why don't you back off and let us deal with this by ourselves? Mm -hmm. Which for, for many Chinese, they would feel would be a much more advantageous position for China. Yes. Um, we all know that the tensions between Japan and China, particularly over the islands, um, caused a great deal of concern in other parts of Asia. I remember at one point when the ADIZ was announced in November of 2013, we did a media call at CFR, and the Vietnamese media were on the call, the Filipino media were on the call, the Austria, I mean, all the way throughout Southeast Asia. So Japan's behavior, with, I mean, China's behavior with Japan presaged, I think, what we're seeing today in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. which is a broader concern about how is China uh, going to deal with problems on its periphery? How committed is China to having a peaceful uh, dispute resolution mechanism in the ASEAN? How committed is China to really acknowledging that it needs to change the way it interacts mm -hmm. with its military in maritime regions that are disputed by others? So I think you've got a lot of questions. Um, U.S. interests, of course, are very obvious, right? And I think first and foremost, they're economic. And I, you know, it's okay that we have, to, we can say we have an alliance and we have obligations, but I think if you were an American ally, you'd be much, much, you'd feel much, much better if we advocated our own interests <laughs> in, in this situation more than just our treaty obligations. But the Asia Pacific is the center, it is the core of the global economy. The United States' future is deeply attached to a peaceful and prosperous Asia. With all of the peace and prosperity that the Chinese have as well. It's not antithetical to the China's rise to see the region that way. Uh, and in fact, the United States has a deep interest in working through with other partners in Asia, how do we accommodate this new geostrategic reality, right? Um, we do have treaties, we have obligations, but I think even more than that, we have a deep commitment to the relationship with Japan. It's not because it's written on a piece of paper that we can refer to text, right? It's because our country has a 70-year history of building a partnership with Japan that is deeply uh, in the interests of the United States. It's in our interest economically, it's in our interest strategically, but it's in the interest also of this broader sense of values and prosperity that we think about. Uh, I can't imagine an American foreign policy without Japan by our side. I just can't. And it's not because I'm the senior fellow for Japan Studies. It is simply <laughs> because it is a critical partnership for the United States. Yeah. Um, so I, there's economic interest, there's strategic interest, there's our interest in the relationship with Japan and other partners across Asia Pacific, but we need to see this region evolve. And it has to be a, an evolution that accommodates China's changing interests, absolutely. Um, but we have to work together to figure out how do we adapt and adjust. And how do we make sure our publics feel reassured that we are effectively adapting mm -hmm. and adjusting. Not that we're backed into a corner or not that we're being pulled in directions we don't want to go. So we have the same kind of problems that I found being articulated in Japan. They may not be as acute when we debate them here in the United States. We don't live right next door, and we haven't had as in-depth experience yet with a changing power dynamic in our relationship. We may never have the same dynamic. Um, and there are th some things about the Japan-China relationship that clearly are about the history of Japan-China. Not the last hundred years, but thousands of years of history between Japan and China. Those are not the kind of history, that's not the kind of history we enjoy with China or with Japan. Mm -hmm. But we have to craft our path forward and we have to learn from the way in which the Japanese have experienced this. And we have to find ways, I think, with our partners in the region to cope. Great, well, a terrific discussion. And we're now going to invite uh, 
uh, everybody to participate, but I'll please ask you to wait for the microphone, um, identify yourself, and uh, please do ask a, a question. So up here in the front, yes. Your hand went up before. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very quick. Thank you very much for your great conversations. My name is Takahiro Motaida. I'm a visiting fellow of Japan Chair and CSIS. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Japan's ad adoption to China's rise. When it comes to China's rise, I first think of it AIIB. So I'd like to ask you this yeah. kind of question. Of so Jap how do you assess from this point of view, uh, adoption to Chinese or China's rise, how do you assess the Japan's decision not to become a founding member of AIIB? Thank you very much. Thank you. So there's all different kinds of ways in which Japan is having to adapt, and the United States is having to adapt as well to this new dynamic China. And the AIIB conversation has certainly drawn our attention in the last couple of months, right? Um, we've been talking to Tokyo, and we've been talking to other allies, our government has, um, for some time now about the Chinese proposition and the Chinese initiative. Um, the media coverage of it has it, has it really fairly critical. Uh, that, that the United States tried to persuade others not to join. Um, I think there are, that would, that's overstating the policy uh, of the Obama administration, frankly. Um, but my own personal view is that we should absolutely welcome moments when China wants to take the initiative. Infrastructure building in Asia, is there's a huge demand for it. Um, I think you know, the fact that China is attempting to multi multilateralize its decision making on this, because we all know China has been building infrastructure, not only in Asia, but in Africa and other places mm -hmm. around the globe as well, that it wants to put a lot of money but bring it forward in a multilateral context should be welcomed. The challenge is the norms and the standards and the governance of this new entity, and of course, especially for Japan and the United States and other countries, we should be very careful. Uh, we, we will ask our taxpayers to put money into the bank. Uh, and as you know, our Congress would have to approve that. So our administration ought to be very cautious and full in getting all the details uh, about governance and because our Congress will demand it if we want to participate. So that's, that's the US. Um, I have been reading of late, and I don't know that this is actually true, but it sounds that to be fairly solid that the Chinese want the largest share of participation, and that's both governance and money, to come from Asian partners. If that's the case, then I think Japan's participation takes on a new and more important meaning uh, in my eyes. Uh, I, get, I think, again, I think Japan should be just as careful in looking to the norm standards and governance debates to making sure it feels comfortable in the, in the way in which the Chinese are evolving uh, and the way in which other partners are evolving, Australia, South Korea, our European partners. But you know, to tell you the truth, I wrote this a couple weeks ago in the, in the New York Times debate we should be, we in Washington should be happy that it is those countries that are participating. They are the ones that help develop the norm standards of our contemporary development debate. Uh, they have not only commercial expertise, but they have intellectual capital to bring to bear. And they have been strong partners in the global institutions as well as in the ADB. So I, I, I'm not as worried about our partners um, participating, but certainly you want to make sure, you being Japan, um, that it is full participation in a way that makes you and your taxpayers comfortable. Another question, yes. Priscilla, wait for the microphone, please. Right here. Thank you. Um, I'm Priscilla Clapp. I'm a retired diplomat. But I work with the Asia Society and USIP. Um, does the dispute, the territorial dispute between Japan and Russia over the Northern Territories have any parallels or bearing on the Senkaku dispute? For example, if Japan and Russia were to reach some kind of an accommodation on the Northern Territories, would there be precedence for the Senkakus? Thank you, Priscilla. I, I, I would I, also like to hear, just to build on that question, what you see as the prospects for a <laughs> Russian-Japanese agreement yes. on the Northern Territories. <laughs> OK. so. I, and I want, I, I want to give a shout out to Priscilla because I read your, your, your writing on much of Japanese foreign policy making when I was a grad student, so thank you. And you're more knowledgeable in the Japan-Russia relationship than I am, but I will try. Um, so I will start with your question and then get to your question, but the prospects, I think, I, I have watched, and I think uh, Prime Minister Abe um, has been very forceful in his conversations with Mr. Putin. I think to a certain extent until you, you had, we headed into the annexation of Crimea, 
and the Russian intervention in Ukraine, uh, I think we had some interesting momentum building, um, but I think it has stopped for obvious reasons. Uh, Japan has uh, joined in with the G7 sanctions based on the Russian behavior in the Ukraine. So for now, it's on pause, and it's a pretty significant pause. Uh, that doesn't mean that Mr. Putin doesn't want it to not be on pause, and I understand he's, he, he, he is fairly uh, energetically uh, trying to, uh, if not persuade Mr. Abe to change the position, at least indicating his interest in the mm. benefits of a better relationship with Russia. Um, I thought the most important thing of the Putin-Abe diplomacy was actually the two plus two. That was the first time that the two of them decided to have a strategic uh, conversation. And as you know, the, the scrambles in and around Japan, we were very focused on China and Chinese military behavior, Russia. but Russia right now has continuous continued its level, Cold War levels, by the way, of scrambles. It has also begun to introduce some uh, interesting uh, missile defense systems into its northern regions. Uh, I wouldn't take my eye off the Russian pressure on Japan in the north because it is significant. Uh, so the two plus two for me, thought I thought that was an interesting moment for the Japanese and mm -hmm. Russians to explore why first of all, and second, to get some stabilization in that piece of, of their relationship. Um, the territorial dispute, as you know, has gone through several iterations, <laughs> excuse me, several, several episodes of negotiation. Um, I don't know that, that Japan, I don't know that Russia's position has changed all that much, to tell you the truth, and I suspect Mr. Putin would not be all that amenable to giving all islands back, the four islands, for those of you who, who don't follow the negotiations. I think the 1950s, iteration was really a little bit closer to the mark. So that's the two smaller islands to Japan and the two larger ones would stay with Russia. Um, I think the politics in Japan today are maybe more accommodating to that formula. Um, I am not 100% sure though that, that there was a, a lot of momentum into resolving the territorial dispute, but that the, that the open discussion on the territorial, reopening that discussion, I thought was an important signal. Mm. That's where I think the, the East China Sea, the Senkaku dispute, perhaps could have benefited. By opening that discussion, yeah. it opened up the avenue of a peaceful conversation. I don't know, to be honest with you, that there are parallels there in terms of how the Japanese feel about the islands, and I think in many ways, uh, the Senkaku today are, the Japanese position on the Senkaku Islands is firmer than it was even a couple of decades ago. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think the Japanese position has ever been not firm, frankly, but the Japanese have chosen not to exhibit or demonstrate effective control over those islands, but Japan does control those islands, or, um, and so has felt that it has the strong position in terms of the legal, the legalities. Um, so beyond that kind of, they're both disputed islands, they have different histories, <laughs> there's both a kind of World War II piece of the history, but, but there really isn't a position, there isn't a way in which the diplomacy is linked to each other, if that was the import of your question. For Japan though, the Northern Territories are an important geostrategic topic, and I think they would like to see, not just Mr. Abe, but previous Prime Ministers, would like to see some more full understanding and a peace treaty with Russia. It would be good for Japan to accomplish that at the, this particular time. Okay, more questions? Okay, here in front. Thank you, um, Beth Smith, a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins Size. Last month we saw a, um, uh, the, the, the Korea, Japan, China um, meetings that we hadn't seen for the last three years. So I was wondering if you might comment on how that triangular relationship is, is affecting yep. the, your prospects. Great, great question. And I think it's, an important, it's important that you, we pay attention to that because one of the, we, we think a lot about the alliance in Japan-China, but one of the other collateral pieces of damage uh, of this island dispute between Japan and China has been the trilateral, the Northeast Asian trilateral. And um, the Chinese decided that they would no longer participate and South Korea wanted to. Um, so the, there was forward leaning in Seoul and, and the Chinese opted out. So without the China at the table, you can't have a trilateral conversation. I think Seoul has been very adroit in reopening that conversation. So as you mentioned last month, um, the foreign ministers of all three countries could meet. Uh, I think that was very positive. Uh, if that, that venue, as you know, began in 2008, so it's a relatively new trilateral conversation, but a very, very important one, especially now, 
Um, but it was originally, you know, it was originally seen as a kind of economic transaction. So kind of, let's talk about the things that we all have common interests in. Let's leave the hard stuff aside. But very quickly after that December 2008 first meeting, the next meeting they were sharing their perspectives on North Korea. So there is a lot of potential, I think, for that that trilateral to really accomplish some of the risk reduction, confidence building that we are anticipating will happen bilaterally. And I hope that the, the, the pre, that, that foreign minister's meeting presaged a summit between the three. I think now that we've got the Bandung meeting between Prime Minister Abe and Mr. Xi, I think the next piece of the puzzle is clearly the summit between Prime Minister Abe and President Park. And so I think once you, you have that bilateral, I suspect the additive <laughs> Momentum will be built, hopefully, for a trilateral summit, maybe in the fall. OK, another question here. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Atsushi Okudera from the Sash uh, Let me just follow up um, uh, 70th anniversary uh, statements from Prime Minister Abe, uh, firstly, to uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, as you know, you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe has just mentioned on BS Fuji a couple of days ago, um, he will not repeatedly to use these kind of language such as, you know, invasion or uh, colonial rule or apology. It seems like uh, he would like some kind of speech, like, you know, uh, he was last year in Brisbane, in, in the uh, Australian Congress, or today in, uh, in Indonesia. So my question is, um, how do you think, what do you think about these kind of Prime, uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Abe's attitude or decision? Uh, do you or United States government uh, concern or, you know, do you think it's, he doesn't have to use this kind of language? Uh, so what, what is your opinion? And to Bani, uh, do you think you know uh, Chinese government and President Xi would accept this kind of speech, which doesn't include uh, these languages? Thank you. You're up first. You want to go first? I'll go first. All right. Um, I think we should not judge Mr. Abe until Mr. Abe makes his speech. And, and I'm, not, I'm not blaming the media, so please don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but um, I have been asked, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked what I sure. want Mr. Abe to say or what he should say. Or so. so I think we all understand that, these, that the speech in the US Congress uh, is an important moment for the prime minister. It's a critical moment for him. Uh, it's very important for our relationship. Um, of course, that the United States and Japan have a strong relationship that is both acknowledging the last 70 years, but also talking about today and looking forward. Um, I can't really speak too much to um, what's going to happen on August 15th. Um, he has repeatedly said he would like to make a statement. Uh, as I said in the opening remarks, though, I'm encouraged by the people he's asked for advice. And again, we all know some of them personally. Uh, he's asked some very savvy, smart people um, to help him in, in thinking about that statement. Here's a larger point, though, and that is something to think about for Japan. Um, every, every 10 years, when you, when you talk to Americans here about the 70th anniversary, and I don't know if others in the room feel the same way, but I was bringing this up in-house at CFR at some point, saying it's the 70th anniversary, it's an important time, we should have programming, and so on. And people kind of scratched their heads and said, 70? Why is 70 important? So I think there's a certain level at which people outside of Asia are, are not quite understanding of the full significance of this. Um, but every 10 years now, it has become expected of your political leader that there will be some statement about the past. And I, from what I understand, I haven't had this conversation with your prime minister, but what I can extrapolate from his public statements is, he doesn't want to have those statements about the past, or he would like to focus on the future. Um, but I think it's important to understand that around the region, even among Japan's friends, frankly, um, the past is still a part of, of, of people's memory, either living memory or the way historically that people remember their country's pasts. And that's true here. It's true in Australia. It's true in not only South Korea and China. It's true across the region. I think the more important piece of the puzzle is what do you say? about that past. 
And again, we can take apart the Murayama statement or we can put little pieces of the Koizumi statement. We can, we can dissect the semantics and I don't think that's really very constructive. But I think what does need to be fully recognized uh, is the spirit in which your country wants to move forward. And that still needs, un still needs to speak uh, to the very painful memory of the 20th century. Now, does, do, do all the Japanese of today understand fully the history of the 20th century? I don't think so. Do all Americans understand the history of the 20th century? I can tell you I've been teaching at college level and, and not, not my current students, so who are in the room, <laughs> not talking about you. Um, but in the past, when I was teaching, people don't remember the Vietnam War and the, you know, when you're 20 years old and you don't know your history. So it is incumbent, I think, upon all of us, educators, political leaders, to continue to converse with the past because we have a future generation that does need to be educated. And they can't forget whatever the past is and not all the stories of the past are bad, and they're not always positive, but we have to have that conversation with our past and we have to learn from it. So this is the 70th anniversary, for example, in the United States, it's the 70th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, we should continue to have that conversation and we do and we will. Um, so I think it's incumbent on all of the countries of the Asia Pacific and we don't necessarily have to just talk about Japanese behavior, but I think it's important that we talk for the future and how we educate our children, not in terms of their national pride, but in terms of how we want to build the region, what kind of region we want for the future. So if I had a little bug in Mr. Abe's ear, <laughs> I would say, tell me what kind, who is Japan today? What do you want your young people to know about the kind of Japan you want to build in the future? and tell us about how important your position in the Asia Pacific is to Japan's future. The relationship with us, but also the relationship with your neighbors. That sounds easy, it's not easy. And so I think all of us will be listening hard for, for that sense of what Mr. Abe's understanding of Japan's future is. So just to very uh, briefly answer where the Chinese are on this issue. You know, I think the Chinese look back at the last couple of years in their relationship with Japan and think they've made some gains, but they've also paid a price. Uh, the gains uh, are, for example, uh, the Chinese believe that they have effectively challenged Japan's administrative control uh, over the islands, not taken it away, uh, but that they have challenged it and that they now share this administrative control, yeah. even though that's not the way the U.S. sees it or the way <coughs> Japan sees it. Uh, but they do see that they have pushed Japan towards uh, recognizing that, they're, that a dispute exists, but they haven't gotten there yet, uh, and so they haven't given up. But, they, but they've paid a price. Uh, in terms of President Obama's statement, which I referred to earlier, uh, which was not new American position but hadn't been said by the President previously, and maybe even uh, more importantly, new Japanese investment in China, which has um, uh, really, really fallen. And so I think there's a, an economic price that is very important to China as the Chinese economy slows down. So I think the Chinese really do not want to see a further downturn in this uh, relationship. And that's, again, what my interpretation is of some of the comments Xi Jinping made to Prime Minister Abe when they met uh, in, uh, in Bandung. But the Chinese need some reassurance. There will be very negative domestic political backlash uh, if Xi Jinping agrees to go forward with substantial improvements in this bilateral relationship. And then there are steps that uh, Prime Minister Abe ta takes, such as another visit to the Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, so I think that the Chinese are looking for reassurance. I don't think the Chinese are setting the bar deliberately so high that Prime Minister Abe can't meet it. But they do want some promises. And remember, the Chinese will think historically. You know, in 2007, Prime Minister Abe was willing to well, give yeah. some reassurances. Right. And so they believe that ultimately this is a, p a potential that they could achieve. Yep. Okay, um, yes, here in front. Oh, gentleman the gentleman right there in the... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Oh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm Andre Sopajo and I'm the um, uh, partner and uh, 
director for Vietnam Southeast Asia and Washington DC for a company in Michigan that has designed a uh, high-speed uh, maglev. But anyway, the great, great presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, my question is this. Um, I, first of all, agree with you so much about the uh, prime minister's coming address to Congress. Think forward. Where are we now and where we want to go? And on that, the Trans-Pacific Partnership looms large. And so my question is, do you believe that the prime minister will or should uh, you know, emphasize that in his address to Congress, uh, hopefully to help President Obama get the <laughs> bipartisan cooperation he needs for this. Yeah. And, and in that, if you could include how far he may move on reducing Japanese protectionist policies on agriculture, and that's it. Thank you. I, I saw I saw Matt Goodman was in the back of the room, so he has he has adroitly left. So I can't call on Matt to because he's he is our TPP guru, and he would yes, be the best. Um, but let me try to address the address the question that you ask. Um, I, First of all, please bring Maglev to the Northeast. Um, <laughs> every time I go to New York, I say, oh, where is Maglev? Um, so I appreciate your work in the United States. Um, two pieces of the puzzle, I think. I think the Prime Minister and the President will have something to say. Um, ultimately, however, this is going to be a, a conversation that Congress has to resolve on TPA. And as you can see, there's some fast and furious writing and rewriting um, and discussion going on on the Hill, and I can read Japanese politics so much better than I can read our congressional politics that I will not even <laughs> venture to hazard a guess. But I do think that there has been a little bit of activity, clearly in anticipation of the prime minister's visit. I am rather confident um, that our negotiators, Japanese and American, despite some of the, the headlines in Japanese newspapers, um, I, that they have had a couple of tough issues and still have a couple of tough issues, including uh, uh, rice protections and tariff rates and the share of the exclusion right, from those tariff rates. Um, so they're talking about what was a WTO mechanism being imported into TPP, and that's really where the focal point is, right? Um, so this is the mechanics. We're in the final mechanics of this trade deal, which I think, if you think back on it, uh, it is incredible how far the United States and Japan have come. I mean, for those of us who remember the 80s vaguely, somewhere in the back, um, <laughs> you know, negotiate, we had trade, trade talks with Japan made people just cringe, and they lasted forever. They were very hard. Somebody in the room probably worked on them. Um, but we've made a lot of progress since then. People have negotiated. And I, but I think so the bilateral piece of this, I'm actually quite confident. If we, as in the United States, can get our politics around it, um, uh, allow, uh, around supporting it, I think we're going to be fine. I think Japan and the United States have led largely because we have very similar interests. We may have some very particular differences on market access issues. We have no differences on the norms, standards, and objectives of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we are a good team. I think the negotiators deserve medals, frankly, for how many miles and how much hours and energy they put into this. I think the president has clearly come out, uh, finally, to say what needs to be said. Uh, I, I don't, I'm a fan of the president. I don't mean that to be critically, but he has now come out. So I think all the political pieces of the puzzle are moving in a direction that will be very successful. So fingers crossed and eyes closed and candles lit. Um, <laughs> we, are, we are headed, uh, but you know, I, I think we shouldn't be, we should be aware of the fact that there are 12 countries in TPP, right? So we're very focused on the US-Japan piece at the moment, but remember, you know, Vietnam and Malaysia, and you know, there's some very complex domestic politics in those countries as well. Uh, and so that this is only the first step towards the larger ambition, but I'm hoping that this year is going to be a particularly good one. Great. Okay. Gentleman over here. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, Washington-based researcher. Uh, looking at uh, the community of China experts in the U.S. that you mentioned, there seems to have been in the last 12 months or so quite a change in tone in the way they've been reacting to developments in China, particularly under the new uh, regime under Xi Jinping, uh, to the point that um, I, we're all aware of what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I, what I'm, the question is, uh, the Japanese uh, obviously uh, must be watching these same developments. Uh, how are they reacting to it, and how does that 
uh, enter into their calculations going forward for dealing with China. Just to, just to be very clear here, we're talking about Chinese building airstrips in the South China Sea? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. I haven't read Mr. Pillsbury article in the Wall Street, Wall Street oh. Journal book. book. Oh, I have. Uh, yes, I have seen the book. I apologize. Um, but there's a very new Asian maritime initiative at CSIS that we should give a shout out to. Um, Mira, where are you? <laughs> um, so I, it's done some excellent work. I mean, I think we're allowing, well, first of all, we have more information than we had in the past. Uh, and I think, again, uh, largely due to some efforts here to, to make sure that that information is flowing uh, appropriately. Um, I'm going to let you answer about the China experts, but I'll talk about the Japanese watching us. And I think you'll see in almost every talk at every think tank in Washington where we discuss Asian maritime issues, you'll find lots of Japanese uh, visiting fellows and uh, journalists and others who are very interested in the topic. Mm. I will say, though, and this is something for the United States and Japan to continue to work at a little bit, um, in those same track two or broader conversations along, among the, along the region about what's going on in the maritime domain or what's going on with China or how to analyze China. I think the United States and Japan don't always see the country the same way. Um, and I've noticed that um, in many conversations that I've had with lots of our China experts and Japanese China experts is often the analytical gaze is directed in different ways. Um, so I think there's still a lot of it's not just that there's work to be done. I think there's a, there's a, we ought to have a deeper appreciation for the fact that we may be concerned about the same policy challenges, but we don't always read China the same way. Um, and so it's very, very important uh, in government and out that we continue to talk about how we're analyzing not just China, but the region at large. It's very easy, and I forgive me for saying this because we are inside the Beltway, but it's very easy inside the Beltway to get very focused on specific policy challenges, but we, sometimes we need to step back and really talk to each other about what is the basis of your analysis of this problem? Where do you see both across not just the South China Sea issues and the maritime issues, but where do you see the economic future of China? Where do you see the political future of China? To continue to have that broader conversation so we can understand the different ways in which we look and understand China. Um, because none of this is very obvious, right? This is a tremendous society that we're all trying to get our hands around in some way. Um, I think you can talk to Chinese experts, and they are also you know, trying to figure out the beast themselves. It's not that obvious. And so I don't think we should underestimate how complex and sophisticated a uh, transition we're seeing in the Asia Pacific. And we should be very careful to be thoughtful and analytical about it. Mm. You want to talk about the China experts part? I don't. Well, I would say I don't think this year has really been a watershed. <coughs> I think me. that we have seen uh, evolution in Chinese policy in recent years, uh, and uh, certainly under Xi Jinping, more activism in Chinese foreign policy. Uh, uh, there, You could point to some examples where it has been positive. Uh, uh, recent uh, Chinese uh, effort to rescue nationals from 10 countries, including Japan, uh, from Yemen uh, would be one example. Uh, but much of what's going on in the Asia Pacific region is of concern in these maritime spaces. And of course, we could talk about uh, cyber as being another area where there's a great concern uh, in some of the uh, trade policies that really favor Chinese companies. Uh, so uh, there's, there are more issues in, in recent years. But Sheila really highlighted something that uh, I would agree with, and that is that even when US and Japanese experts analyze the uh, consequences of China's policies the same way, they sometimes disagree the over causes. the motivations right. for those policies. And I have found it to be a useful conversation with Japanese experts to try and really dig into that question. Many Japanese will explain China's policies based on factional politics, based on China's need to have an external threat or enemy uh, to forge national unity, and that Japan is always that easy whipping boy. Um, and uh, there is, I think, in the United States, although people who are experts on China don't at all dismiss the domestic drivers, um, there's also another set of drivers uh, 
uh, that is seen as important. It's the want, desire to build the Chinese dream, uh, the fact that China is now stronger and for many years has talked about um, righting the wrongs of the past, but only really now has, has the capability to actually start doing it. Uh, so, but it, it, it is important, I think, to, to have these conversations so that we can really have a more common understanding and hopefully more consensus about what explains Chinese policies. Uh, the reason, of course, being that we both want to influence them. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to see China be uh, a, a proactive right. uh, but positive uh, contributor to Asia-Pacific global security problems, et cetera. And in order to influence those policies, you have to correctly understand really what's, uh, what's motivating them. Can I add another point to that, Bonnie? And, and, and this is, it also feeds into the work that you do in trying to understand you know, the, the crisis response and, and how we think about the future in the region and crisis management. Um, one of the reasons I wrote this book really was also to get under the skin, if you will, of the policy in Japan. You know, right now we, we tend to, we, everything gets collapsed in the Japan-China relationship on, uh, into this island dispute. And in fact, there's a, there's a whole array of differences between the Chinese and, and Japanese governments that have evolved and have emerged and things that we don't quite appreciate. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they're quite distinct. Um, but I think one of the reasons that I did write the book and I did take on these very disparate kinds of case studies of policy interaction is to say that there's more contention in the relationship, but there's also a struggle on both sides. You don't have to assume hostility on one side or the other. Sometimes yeah. with the island dispute, you get into that kind of interpretation of what's going on. You don't have to assume that China is trying to do something to Japan or vice versa, the Japanese are trying to do something. But in fact, the problems are more complex. The policy solutions, in some ways, tend to be somewhat more intrusive, right? The interdependence is deep and it's real. Uh, it's positive in the macro for both societies, but not always in the micro. There's not always, and I found this in the food safety, it was a fascinating case study, was the regulatory framework was inadequate to the task of ensuring food safety. And this is a country, as for many of you who know Japan, this is a country that takes pride in food safety right, and has a deep regulatory system. But as the relationship changed as more and more Japanese companies were going to China to have joint ventures to produce food, right? The regulatory system hadn't caught up with that reality. So in each of the case studies, you don't end up with an anti-China, rah-rah, right-wing nationalist. You end up, in some ways, with some very different diagnostics of the policy problem. But the two governments are struggling with those. Di I only did one side of the puzzle. I'm sure if somebody did the Chinese side of the puzzle, you would come up with similar but different kinds of conclusions about these policy issues. But that's what we mean when we talk, or what I say when I talk about adjusting to a rising China. It's not just military, military. It is a much more complex task of reassuring your domestic interests that their interests are gonna be protected. And that's a government, that's a governance challenge. And I think for the Japanese government, that is a huge challenge across a variety of issue areas. And similarly, it may, or may end up that way for us as well. So geostrategic change doesn't happen over there, over the horizon on the other side of the Pacific. It's actually deeply embedded in our own societies and we're going to have to adapt and adjust too. Okay, more questions over here. Uh, Justin Dunnocliffe, I work for the Department of Defense. Um, my colleagues and I are interested in where Japan is going with military normalization. And personally, I'd like to know how that goes forward um, in relation to public opinion. Because over the decades, it's just never, it's never taken hold, and it doesn't seem to have really changed so far. So I'd like to know what you think about that. Thank you. That's my current book. <laughs> My next book. <laughs> no. um, it's never ending over at CFR. Um, we are writing away. Um, I'm actually actually writing a, 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 little, a little short piece on this question of where the public stands. And I went back and looked. You know, over the decades, the cabinet, Japanese cabinet secretary, has you know Naikaku, who has taken polls on Japanese attitudes specifically towards the self-defense forces, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's may not be <laughs> fascinating to read polling data, but it is kind of fascinating to look at, A, what the questions were back in the 1960s when this started, which is, do you know what the self-defense forces is? <laughs> Would you allow your children to join? You know, those kinds of questions, right? Which is really where Japan was, right, in the first decade or two after uh, the war ended and the occupation ended. Um, the Japanese public did not want 
to have a lot to do with a national military. And you, you look at the sweep now, and again, we're many, many decades after that, right? The Cold War has ended. Um, we've had, in 2011, a demonstrable out, uh, outburst of popular support uh, and confidence in the self-defense forces after the, disaster, the triple disasters, right? There was a poll taken, and I can't remember where, um, I'm not quoting it in my article, but I tried to find it again. But it was astounding to me in, in tw late 2011, said, who do you trust the most? And of course, the, the prime minister was very low on that list. <laughs> Diet members were equally low, and the self-defense force was at the top. So you now have a public that sees its military, they're more comfortable with their national military. All that being said, um, you have a public that's also much more nervous about its situation in its neighborhood. So nor whether it's North Korean missile proliferation or nuclear uh, proliferation, whether it's this maritime challenge of China and the island dispute, you have a public that's more acutely aware of the need for defense and a strong security. Overwhelmingly, when you see the more recent polling data, um, they ask, do you want a stronger defense? Yes. Uh, what are the instruments you want to uh, do, use? The U.S.-Japan alliance comes up. Um, so it doesn't come, it doesn't translate into, therefore, we must have more autonomy. We must have stronger militaries, or we must have offensive weapons. None of that. You get none of that. You get a very firm conviction that we ought to pay more attention to our national security, that the alliance with the United States is the best means. Uh, but yes, maybe we ought to strengthen our defenses a little bit. <laughs> so um, I think you know it's, it's a natural evolution. It's a slow process. And you can look at Mr. Abe's announcement last summer uh, on the reinterpretation of the right of collective self-defense. And his approval rating dipped precipitously. The only other time it's dipped is when the national secrecy law was, mm -hmm. was passed. It dipped precipitously. Um, the polling data in the national security law said, we need more time to talk about this. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so, so you want to look at the opinion polling data a little bit skeptically, because I'm not sure it gives us a strong statement, but it gives us some hints. And those hints are on issues such as allowing too much state control over private life, Japanese, got, Japanese people are quite sensitive, right? As would we be, right? We are as well. Um, and on the question of the Constitution, you get a very ambivalent public response. Um, and I think you can see in the parliamentary debate today uh, that, again, I think if Mr. Abe had had his way, he would have probably wanted that reinterpretation to be much more forward-leaning. Certainly, Mr. Kitaoka's report was much more forward-leaning, uh, but he took a... He, Backed, backed off a little bit, took a very mission-specific orientation. Uh, and I think in the parliament, you're going to see a very mission-specific outcome. Uh, so I think the democracy is alive and well in Japan. The Japanese people are quite skeptical of anything that has to do with messing with that constitution. Um, but all, be, all that being said, <laughs> there's a quite lively debate in Japan today about, well, maybe we should have a conversation mm. about amending our constitution. But I wouldn't judge that to mean that the Japanese are running to change Article 9. I think that may be least, or least likely to occur anytime soon. Mm. One last question, and then uh, we'll move to our uh, reception. OK, over here, our visiting fellow. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow from Taiwan. Um, my question is very simple. Um, uh, among the circumstances we just talked about, do you think, from your point of view, uh, what kind of a role Taiwan is able to play? Um, for instance, like um, especially from the perspective, perspective of long term, uh, when China uh, has been rising uh, all the time, and from the short term, uh, especially for um, Taiwanese election, is going to uh, taking place uh, next year. So uh, from your point of view, do you think uh, what kind of role uh, Taiwan can play uh, in that kind of uh, circumstances? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that both Tokyo and Beijing, um, and Washington for that matter, were quite fortunate to have Mind Zhou as president uh, in Taipei when the crises were, were coming up. Um, Taiwan, as I mentioned earlier, of course, has a stake in the outcome of those islands, right? But has long had fisheries interests, right? And I thought that his uh, ability to reach out to Mr. Abe and to uh, offer uh, the, 
opportunity uh, for Japan to conclude that fisheries treaty. It was very astute. Um, and as you know, your president also is a, is a, is a deep expert <laughs> on the territorial <laughs> dispute and on the East China Sea. And he has some very constructive ideas, I think, about building confidence and peace around the East China Sea. Um, so on the dispute itself, I think as I, as an outsider watching from this side of the Pacific, as I watch you approach your election or your, your people approach that election, I wonder what that election means for the peaceful management of the island dispute. You know, we just finally got Mr. Xi and Mr. Abe to begin the conversation on risk reduction. Uh, Taiwan's role clearly will be very critical to making sure that that moves in a, in a positive way. Um, I would hate to see that become fodder for political campaigns and things like that. Well, we, we all know political campaigns uh, tend to go off in directions that are not always in the best foreign policy interest, right? Um, in this country, at least. I don't know about your country. Um, but I think it's, an important <laughs> it's important to understand what Taiwan has already done and your president has already done to facilitate what we see today. Um, so I hope that Taiwan will continue to play a positive role in <laughs> however that risk reduction effort takes place. Um, but I think the larger question looking forward is really the cross-straits relations and how that is managed. We have had the, the benefit of having a very stable and steady relationship between uh, Taipei and Beijing. Uh, granted, I understand there are some, some citizens in your country who don't always appreciate all of, all of the aspects of that cross-straits relationship, but as a stabilizing factor in the region, it has been had a tremendous influence. So your domestic choices, the choices you make in your election and the choices that your political leaders consider uh, as they uh, think about this relationship with Beijing have immense consequences for Northeast Asia. I'll make just very three quick suggestions of things that I think Taiwan can do, though I have a much longer list, but I'll limit it to three. Uh, uh, further liberalize trade, make Taiwan a more attractive trading partner uh, to ensure that uh, if TPP is completed, that Taiwan will be considered to be a, a possible participant in uh, the next tranche of, uh, of uh, uh, those uh, parties that are going to join. Uh, I think that there is a lot more that needs to be done in that regard. Uh, right now, Taiwan is um, not included in the regional economic integration process. Uh, that is not seen as uh, good for Japan or good for the United States. I think both Japan and the U.S. want Taiwan to be economically prosperous. That means not just a good economic relationship with the mainland, but a good economic relationship with the region. Um, uh, secondly, uh, to take steps to strengthen Taiwan's defense. Uh, if Taiwan is seen as uh, vulnerable to coercion from the mainland, whether it be uh, military or economic, that's, that's a problem. For Japan, it's a problem for the United States. Uh, Taiwan's defense spending, as you know, um, has not kept pace with the promises uh, of the current or the, or the previous uh, president. So I think uh, going forward, there's, there's more that Taiwan can do uh, for uh, its own defense. Um, and then lastly, uh, I think that uh, Taiwan could have a potentially important role to play on the issue of the South China Sea. It is, it, after all, in fact, the Republic of China's original 11-dash line claim uh, in the South China Sea. And so I think it could be very valuable if the government in Taiwan would explain to the world what that original 11-dash <laughs> line meant. Why was it created? Was it intended to be a demarcation of national boundary or not? Um, and then to go perhaps one step further and declare what Taiwan's claim is today. In other words, to bring it into line with uh, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And so I, there, is, um, there is no other um, claimant that can help in that regard in the way that Taiwan could. So I think that those are just three small suggestions. <laughs> so there you go. You probably got more than you asked for, didn't you? <laughs> That's right. You ask a question, you get a detailed answer. Uh, but uh, 
This has really been a, a terrific session. I'm thank so you. glad that you agreed to do it. I want to thank you all for coming. There thank are you. books outside as well as wine and food yeah. that I hope you will enjoy. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Sheila Smith. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs>